three this morning on, on June 15th, we will call to order a meeting of the Waxahachie ISD crisis management team. This is our summer meeting. Um, by law, we're required to have at least one meeting um, each semester, one in the spring, one in the fall, and then we're supposed to have one in the summer. This is our summer meeting. Um, we do more um, than is required by law. We, we um, always have at least two meetings in the fall semester and two meetings in the, in the spring semester. We generally only have the one meeting um, in, in the summer because we, we know that some of our folks um, will be going off contract uh, very soon. Um, and so this will be um, our, our summer meeting, but thank you um, very much. We've got a, a full house here, um, almost our entire committee here um, that, that, that cares deeply um, about taking care of um, our kids' safety and their security um, as a primary focus for what we do at the district. So I'm very appreciative for all of you in attendance. If, for whatever reason, um, you did not sign in, um, please go ahead and do that. Make sure that you sign in because um, one of the things that we'll have to do um, this year um, is in September, by September 9th, is certify some things um, to the governor. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but the attendance sheet at this meeting will be one of the things that we're giving um, the, the governor's office and Texas School Safety Center. So we just want to make sure that we have an accurate record of everyone's attendance here. Um, as always, you know, we've posted notice for this meeting. Um, pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, we have a recording going of this meeting, and the recording of this meeting will, will be posted on our website. At this time, if you would, please look at the minutes from our previous meeting. Our most recent meeting was April 13, 2022, just two months ago. And once you've had an opportunity to look at these minutes, I will accept a motion to approve. All right, we got a motion from Cam Bridgers. Do we have a second? Oh, is that Melissa Bousquet? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I got a motion from Melissa Bousquet. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Melissa. We got a second from Cam Bridgers um, to approve um, our, our minutes. Any discussion? Here none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, our, our minutes are unanimously approved. And at this time, um, we're going to move into our, our first discussion item, and that's the our continued development of our SRO program and security team under the leadership of Waxhatch Police Department, Lieutenant Josh Oliver. And before um, letting him do that, I want to say thank you um, to Chief Goolsby, um, who, who is here, um, and, and just, give, just give thanks um, for the efforts um, and the collaboration uh, with Waxhatch Police Department that we enjoy. And we're going to be sharing some more information with our community um, to never lose sight of and take for granted. Um, our relationship and the good things that, that we have with, with our friends at the police department. Not only our SROs um, that, that are fully dedicated to us and, and our security team that, that's here all the time, um, but that every one of our um, Waxahachie Police Department officers um, has badge access um, for immediate entry into Waxahachie ISD schools, has on their patrol vehicle um, video capability to link into um, our surveillance cameras, so in the event of a 911 call, uh, immediately knows what's going on in the school, that um, we give um, open access at our schools to our uh, police officers um, to come in, um, have office space, do their reports um, during their patrol duties, um, have um, things like coffee available for them, um, just to invite them in, because police presence um, at our schools is welcome, it's good, and we see it, and we're appreciative of it. Um, so that in the event of, of good days and certainly bad days, um, that, that the people of Waxhatch Police Department are, are always there and able to come in. We, we very much value that. We have our superintendent here at, at this meeting who I, I know um, wanted to share some thoughts um, about the priority um, of safety and security and, and the district's efforts to address that. Dr. Hollingsworth? this way in particular, and, and one of the things I wanted to share with this group, uh, th this, the, the event that, that occurred in the Valley uh, touched me in a particularly, uh, in a particular way because of my relationship with the superintendent in the Valley. Uh, Hal Harrell is, is as good a human being as I know, a good school person, I've had the opportunity to get to know him. Uh, I first met him, uh, when you become a new superintendent, your superintendent for the first time, they have a 
Sunshine Superintendents Academy. And all the brand new superintendents in the state come together multiple times during their very first year. And when I, my first year in Bay Area was my first year ever as a superintendent, and Hal and I were, were at that together. We got to know each other. And we met several times that year. And he's in Region 20. And uh, so this has been on my heart. I know it's been on all of our hearts. But I wanted to share with you a couple of things. The first thing is, I, I've had a number, a number of phone calls. I've had a number of phone calls from uh, patrons uh, who have asked, you know, or parents in particular, emails from parents who said, my goodness, you know, tell me what, what y'all are doing, what are you going to do, etc." And uh, my response to them has been pretty much like what I'm going to share with you this morning. The first thing I want you to know is I bring fresh eyes to Watsatchee ISD as a superintendent, and I will tell you that we have the best security of any district in which I've ever worked. Period. Hands down. No, that's the truth. And that, and that is a reflection on the great work that had nothing to do with me. Uh, a lot of great work that had, and, and, and it does reflect back on uh, Ms. Kriegel and her six colleagues who, who serve on this school board and making that a commitment. And so we, we owe a debt of gratitude to those who have come before, and I, I'm very grateful for that. I am extremely grateful for Chief Goolsby, the relationship that we have uh, with the city, but specifically with Waxahachie PD, with our fire uh, personnel. Uh, that was evidence when we had our, our drill back in, in March. It's special. And, and if you've not been in other places, you need to know uh, that that is a special relationship. I have shared with families. Uh, many of them did not know that we had armed marshals where we don't have an SRO. And, 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 and in the case of Waxahachie High School, multiple uh, armed marshals. And they were relieved to hear that. I have shared with our families that, you know, when they ask, are you all open to fill in the blank? My answer is, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. We are open to having discussions about anything. Because I'm a school person, uh, I lead schools in 2022, okay? And I hate to say that, but I'm open to anything. I'm open to any conversation. Are you, all, are you open to Army teachers? Yes, I am. Are you open to fill in the blank? I'm open to having a conversation about anything that will keep children safe. Okay, that's that's the bottom line. That is not a don't don't worry about if you're if you're opposed to that. That doesn't mean that's an edict or anything. I'm, I just want you to know I'm open to having a conversation. The last thing I want to say this though that I share with everyone, and I wanted to share with this group because this is particularly important. The number one guard against these kinds of things happening is the relationship that exists between someone on every campus and all 10,183 children we have. Somebody. And that, that's, that's, I'm looking at Ginger because that's, I know that's so important. It's not just counselor's job. It's all of our jobs. That's what, and, and our folks know that. And that's something I'll emphasize when we come back in, in the fall relationships and seeing every child, seeing every one of them is our number one defense. It's better than any security system we can buy, any locked door system, bulletproof glass, whatever we can dream of. Mm -hmm. All those things are important. But none of that takes the place for the relationships that we're able to nurture with our children. And so I apologize for the sermon that people who work with me are used to it. Uh, but, but I just want to say uh, uh, that's, that's my comfort as a leader uh, in, in, this, in this environment that we find ourselves in today. But I will say, make no mistake that Waxahachie ISD, given the relationship we share with all of these entities and with our community and the fact that so many people care about what happens in our schools, and, and that's special. The fact that so many people care, we are better situated than most. Uh, but we all know that, that it can happen anywhere at any time. Uh, so I want to end with a thank you and just say thank you so much for your uh, taking these roles so seriously because uh, it's critically important uh, for what we do. So anyway, Lee, thanks for the.
Dr. Hollingsworth, thank you. Thank you for, for your leadership. And I know that um, your thoughts, I know one, are sincere. Two, I know it's a comfort. It's a comfort to the folks that are here um, that, that care about safety and security, but it's an even greater comfort to all of our folks um, that entrust their kids to us and um, know that it's paramount on your mind, uh, on our mind, on our school board's mind. So thank you very much. And Lieutenant Oliver, your presentation. Well, uh, just to hit on what the SRO program and security team are doing this summer, um, we do have a YMCA camp that's going on in Northside, and I know I got I had several phone calls from concerned citizens going, "Is there security at Northside while this is going on?" Even though it's not a WISD camp, we do have security officers there, and they've been doing a fantastic job helping out, keeping an eye on those kids. Also, where food distributions going on. That's also where we've had security officers. So Belvis has done a magnificent job just coordinating all of that. That is no small feat uh, to accomplish during the summer. And the people that work with them on the security team have done it just enthusiastically. They, there was never any question about whether or not we'd be able to fill those spots during the summer. And anytime I ask Belvis, hey, do we have the staffing to cover this? He goes, give me the green light and we'll get it covered. Um, so that that's just shows how dedicated those guys are to their job, even though it's summertime. Um, our SROs right now, they're, uh, yes. Do we have anybody at our sports camps or, or do they have a, a somebody to answer to for the sports camps? Just bring your call. We do have security at the high school for summer school. They make the rounds in those areas. Okay. So they call their right now. I, that's what I was going to say is at the high school, there's, uh, if you go through the gym, there's constantly like volleyball and basketball practice and stuff going on. And uh, every time I've walked through there, there's been a member of the security team in there with those kids. Yeah, I just didn't know. Uh, Duncanville had brought to light that recent thing that happened this week <laughs> that, hey, athletic uh, facilities, uh, that, that's a place where we're vulnerable. And right now, at Lumpkin Stadium while strength and conditioning is going on and while uh, two-a-days and all those practices are starting up with football. Um, I was talking to Terry Minton, and Terry Minton goes, there's big burly coaches running around everywhere, which is all Duncanville had at their athletic facility. Uh, however, Belvis and I are open to, if we feel like it's necessary to have a security officer there at the football stadium, we're open to that staffing. I think that's a discussion that we can have is, is it worth it? Do we need to be doing that? Are we okay with it? And then our, our for our school marshals, all of our school marshals um, go to T. Cole to receive 80 hours of training. Um, anytime we wind up um, having, having a marshal leave us, um, when we um, hire, we then get more folks signed up to go to marshal training. They get that eight training. Summertime's a great time to get that accomplished so that our board can then certify yeah. um, people to be marshals. Do we have folks going for training this summer? We do. Uh, in fact, I think there's two uh, two people that are coming up, like, this what, week, next week? This week. Uh-huh. Uh, to get their training taken care of. Also, uh, I'm really glad this this year we don't we didn't have much turnover with the security team. Uh, we had uh, one individual that resigned, and we're we've already got applications to fill that spot. And then it looks like we're probably going to have one of our security officers that leads the team to go be uh, join a law enforcement career. Um, uh, so far, there's several. Uh, different departments that are looking at that individual. So it looks like we're most likely going to lose that one. But uh, Belvis and I are working right now to fill those spots. Um, and so at every campus, we will have school marshals. Absolutely. In addition to then the SROs we have um, stationed at our secondary campuses. Yes. So, so are we talking about now for the school marshals in junior high? Because we don't have a school marshal there, just SRO. We have, we have one that floats the junior highs, and then we have the SROs at junior highs. Yes, we have one of the roles at junior Right, right. But are we not saying we couldn't marshal at the junior highs? We're just going to keep it as a role? 
At, at this time, there's not new positions. So there's marshals at every elementary school. There's marshals at the um, high school and at global. At the junior highs, you have one that floats, but you have a dedicated SRO officer there full time. Yeah. Ms. Othier? We, we hope not. That's, that's the problem is we don't have any control over when that is. And it's really kind of a deal. Lisa will get a phone call and it's like, guess what? This is the week that we're doing this training. We're like, okay, and we're kind of scrambling to make it happen. So. But the 80-hour training is about to commence <laughs> more immediately. The answer is as soon as possible based on T. Cole availability. So, Ms. Kriegel. Are there times when the SROs are pulled off campus on junior high campus that we uh, tell them we don't have somebody, we only have one uh, program? So, most of the, uh, I would say it's very rare. Uh, that we end up pulling like two of our junior high officers. Usually when we do, they go to an elementary school campus because there's some sort of criminal something that's taken place. Um, we really avoid using our, we don't use our SROs for things like, um, you know, some of our self-contained kids that get out of control or anything like that. The only time they'll leave the junior high is if there's a criminal investigation that needs to go on at an elementary school. When they do that, we have one of the, the school marshals head over to that junior high and fill that spot. Um, if the junior high guy is already taken, then we pull either the elementary rover or somebody from the high school and send them over to that junior high. But it's, it's very rare. No, and if they're out sick or something like that, that's when we use that. Uh, that school marshal to fill in their spot. And Chief, Chief Goolsby's been good that... Yeah, or Josh goes or Josh. over there. Essentially, at least 71% of the time, so the, the, the school days, you know, we, um, when, when we're at school, the priority, the priority, the job for, for those um, SRO, those, those school resource officers, is us. So WPD has, has been um, very intentional to, to use... Um, PD time on days we don't have school for our SROs. Yes. Help me clarify. What is the difference between a school marshal, an SRO, and a school security officer? Like, what is the level? Well, so Ms. Robinson has a question. Uh, I'm going to be as I'm going to be as intentional in my response as I can be okay. within law. Okay. Um, the SRO, school resource officer, is an officer. Um, from Waxhatch Police Department. That, that, that's a peace officer that um, is not um, wholly housed at the ISD. Uh, the ISD can have a police department. We don't have a police department. We, we have a great relationship with the police department, um, Waxhatch Police Department. And Waxhatch Police Department, led by Chief Goolsby, they're experts in police. Those are the SROs. So anytime you hear SRO or school resource officer, we are talking about someone from Waxhatch Police Department that's dedicated to us. But in addition to those dedicated to us, um, if, if there's an allegation of um, sexual assault of a child, um, something along those lines, there are um, investigators that are not SROs dedicated to us that um, Waxhatch Police Department will, at that point, it becomes the full-time job of someone like Detective Elizabeth Gladwell um, to come help us. So we don't lose the support, the additional support of other police department officers just because we have dedicated SROs. Um, and same with patrol, same with you name it, um, criminal investigators um, from Waxhatch Police Department. Um, in regard to our security, 
Um, we employ security officers. We have the ability as a school district to appoint school marshals. The identity, the specific identity of a school marshal is confidential as a matter of law. And so I can't tell you who is a school marshal. I can tell you that we employ security officers and we also, as a district, appoint school marshals. And we, we have done this um, with the cooperation with the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, that's TCOL. We've been very transparent with TCOL as to who we're sending, but that's a confidential process and it's confidentially appointed by the board. I will tell you that we have security officers at every campus. I will tell you we have school marshals at every campus. I will not tell you by name who our school marshals are. That was not what I was asking. I think what was confusing me was when we said that the school marshal is a rover, which means the campuses, that's what And on our secondary campuses, there's often multiple. And in our at WHS, there are multiple. Eight, nine. <laughs> in all caps. Right. No. Right. Just, just to give the role. Yeah, give the role. Okay. No, all right. And, and we have a full agenda. So, Ms. Bousquet. <laughs> Absolutely. So every two years you have to go through a recertification course with TCOL where you go through all the classes and the scenarios and everything like that. And we send our people to that. In addition to that, though, uh, we and our team take it a step farther. Not only that, twice a year, um, which I will say is more than the police department, our security team is required to qualify with their handgun. Uh, and they go through the same firearms qualification that the Waxahachie Police Department does. Uh, if you don't pass that firearms qualification the first time, you get to go back, do your classes, do some work on it, and we give you uh, a short amount of time, I think it's two weeks, and you can come back and try again. If you don't do it that second time, you're not working with us anymore. Um, so that's part of it. Also, during the summertime, we work closely with the Waxahachie Police Department. There's different trainings like alert training where you learn, you have sim munition rounds and you get shot at and you learn how to clear buildings and things like that. And we work with our trainers at the police department to put our guys through some sort of tactical or tactical medical training every summer. So we're already gearing up and getting ready to go through that again. Um, so I will say that yes, there is ongoing training that's mandated by the state for school marshals, we go above and beyond of that training with our team. All right. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, team. Um, before Uvalde occurred, we, as a district, asked our staff, asked our students, just general climate survey questions. Well, as a part of a general climate survey for uh, every, every campus, every department, um, safety and security um, was a component of that. And, Lieutenant Oliver went through each one of those um, campus responses. And so our, our next agenda item is, is to discuss our um, survey results and then discuss potential plans um, that we have to, to address some of the concerns. And again, um, this was part of our work just in the spring with a normal school year and a, and a normal approach um, to, to looking at what are, are the needs on our campuses. And uh, not to steal Josh's thunder, but, but my hope is for all of our kids be able to feel the same confidence that our one young man at a junior high said <laughs> in response to, do you feel safe at school? I'm 6'2", I'm 205 pounds, and I'm in the eighth grade. That was the only response. <laughs> but that young man felt pretty secure, and I hope all of our uh, kids can feel that secure. <laughs> he, felt pretty, he felt pretty safe. Uh, yes, we did this survey before you all happened, and I, uh, I can Uh, the feeling of safety and security amongst our teachers and students. 
Uh, I'm going to go through this really fast. I'm not going to hit on everything because it's several slides long and we don't have time for it. But if you want a copy of kind of the feedback and things like that, just email me and I'll send you a copy of this presentation. Uh, key words that were really positive. Uh, the first one I want to point out is drills. Uh, it's interesting to talk to parents and I talk to people that are like, hey, we have to do these active shooter drills. When we turn the lights out, we hide in the corner of the room. What kind of emotional impact is that having on our kids? I was really surprised to see that a lot of the time when kids were filling out these surveys, they would say, I feel safe because we practice drills. And that really made me, that would just sure be to let me know that, hey, we're doing something right with those. Some of the other things we see, they feel safe and they see the officers. They have relationships with teachers. I will say this, that um, with the students, when they were filling out their surveys, if they had a close personal relationship and interaction with their teachers and their security officers, those kids felt safe. It didn't have anything to do with firearms. It didn't have anything to do with any, any, anything else. If they have a personal relationship and they feel like they're friends with the security officer and their teacher, those students felt safe. Some of the other things they talked about is, hey, there's bulletproof glass all around me. Uh, if they think that, we're going to let them keep thinking that. So, yeah. Uh, some negative words that we heard about. You know, uh, some of them did say things about uh, drills that it was kind of nerve wracking and some of them makes it feel like they're not safe. Uh, but that was rare compared to the ones that said it was a positive thing. Uh, more often than anything, they talked about bullying and kids being mean to them at school were the reasons why they didn't feel safe. Um, they did talk about I had nervous, uh, anxiety, I get nervous at school was something that we see popped up a lot. It goes hand in hand with that emotional uh, factor there, the, the mental health factor. Um, it was rare they talked about shooting. A lot of the times they would talk about, especially on the secondary campus, there was uh, Talk about things that go on in the bathroom, like drugs and sex and stuff like that. Um, elementary staff. If you looked at this, we said, hey, do you feel safe and secure at your schools? 48% said they agreed. 37% said they strongly agreed. Uh, only about 5% were to the negative and 9% were neutral. That tells me that a vast majority of the staff feels safe at our elementary schools. Uh, as far as the students, 92% uh, of our elementary school students said they felt safe in our schools. Our goal is 98%, so we have a little bit of work to do. Um, but 92% of our elementary schools said they were safe. Uh, that's 78% of the uh, students at Cliff Elementary said they did, only 11% said they disagreed and were neutral. Uh, that staff members uh, said that. Uh, Cliff students, 87% of them said they felt safe in school. Um, that's still a pretty high number, uh, but that's still something we need to work on at Cliff Elementary. And we could probably have a two-hour discussion about my kids at Cliff Elementary School might not feel safe. Uh, I think a lot of that's going to be an emotional mental health factor, kind of family support system thing going on. 65% uh, of their parents said that uh, their child's school was a safe environment. Uh, the staff said they feel safe. The duress act was something that was really positive, and they said, hey, having people visible in our school is something that they really like. And I'll go back on that clip. It's, it was actually 100% that agreed. It was 65 that strongly agreed and 35 oh, that gotcha. agreed. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And it's so all positive. Parents, yeah, the parents are very positive. 65% strongly agreed with that. Um, you see, these are examples of some of these, uh, some of these comments. It was, hey, I feel safe because we have a really nice security guard. That's something that we saw time and time again. The other thing that you might see is I don't feel safe. Why? Because I'm a kid and I'm, a, I'm vulnerable. Anybody can show up at my school and break in. They don't know that, hey, we have these safety measures in place. Parents, they talk about things like this is the only negative comment that was thrown out uh, is, hey, we need to work on our traffic there at the school. Um, so we can control that a little bit. We'll see, we'll see if we can clean that up a little bit. We'll see. 
Dunaway Elementary, this is the staff. Um, 94% agree. Is that right? No, it looks like you've got a, a lot to Maybe disagree. Maybe that's off. I don't know. Anyway, with the students, uh, that's Richard Gonzalez. They always say that, don't they? Uh, 91% of their students, uh, and that's a pretty high number of uh, parents, agree that Dunaway was a pretty safe school. Uh, crossing guards was something that they pointed out that was a really great job. Delphi Elementary School, uh, that's overwhelmingly uh, pretty safe. Um, only 10% uh, were kind of just neutral in that area. Yeah. Students, 71% Delphi Elementary. Uh, one of the interesting things about that, I think, might be uh, they did have an incident where there was somebody that went a little uh, haywire in their drop off line one morning. And I think that happened. I believe Ms. Kriegel has a question. That, that's only seven kids completed their survey. So yeah, so it's not accurate numbers. Uh, this one had, the parents had 63 surveys. The parents are pretty happy with how safe the school is. Uh, and then, you know, these are the, when you're talking about elementary schools, you say, do you feel safe? They'll say things like, yeah, but no. But yeah, I mean, those are kind of the things that we get. 28 surveys from the staff at Marvin. Uh, the only, uh, I think it's 4% disagree that they were safe. 82% of the kids that turned in their surveys didn't. Uh, I'm just going to fly through these real quick. 91% of the students at Northside felt they were pretty safe. Why? Why do you feel safe? Well, because there's guards, there's bulletproof vests. And these are the things that I can see that make me feel good uh, at the school. And then overwhelmingly, we would see comments like this, like, hey, it doesn't matter what you do. I live in America. I might get shot when I go to school. Uh, the things that happen on the news impact how our students view going to school. And it's going to give them anxiety. And especially when you hear about, oh, man, there were even schools in Texas where there was a shooting of uh, Shackleford, their staff is uh, positive to students too. Um, parents are positive at Shackleford. Uh, this is the kind of, I feel safe because there's police officers, there's security officers. Like I said, just our presence there seems to really kind of make the students, uh, as you can see, feel safe and calm. Why? Because there's a big, strong, nice guy that's walking around and it's his full time job to take care of me. Uh, when you see things from parents, uh, it's you see like bullying and counseling was something that came back with parents. Not so much school shooting and stuff like that. They were worried more about uh, you know the emotional welfare of kids. Ninety-five percent of the students at Simpson were positive. Uh, their parents were pretty positive. Only two percent uh, disagreed or didn't have a response. Uh, Simpson positive. Turner Pre-K. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, everybody knows where Turner Pre-K is located, right? Um, this is one, understandably, we've got some people that, the staff, even though despite the area it was in, only 8% said they disagreed with it. For the most part, parents were saying it's a safe and learning environment. Only 9% strongly disagreed. The main thing that came back about Turner Pre-K is because of the neighborhood that it's in. And they're saying, hey, while my kid's been to school there, there's been things like the police department investigating the shooting or things along those lines. So uh, it didn't really have to do with the fact that our security does a good or bad job on the school. It has everything to do with the neighborhood that school's located in. Uh, Wedgworth, 30 students came back. It was 97% positive. Their parents were really positive about the presence there, too. Security guards, teachers, they make them feel safe. Sometimes there's things that pop up, like, hey, there's equipment that's broken. We need to work really hard to fix that and do a better job of getting that addressed, so that's good. Uh, Wildman, 91%. Uh, their parents were strongly positive about the school safe environment. Um, they, they were all positive. Junior high. Junior high, uh, 
as far as the staff is concerned altogether, only 6% disagreed. For the most part, they felt like their campus was safe. Junior high, Coleman Junior High, only 8% of their 26 surveys turned in, so they didn't feel safe. Uh, Coleman parents, for the most part, felt like their kids were safe. Uh, the staff, this is the comment that we got, but hey, I absolutely feel like it's safe and secure at Coleman. And that's, Coleman is interesting too because uh, this parent brought it up. They are in a busy spot of town. Where you've got Walmart across the street, HEB on the other side, you've got the racetrack there and traffic <coughs> moving around. And I think for us to do as good of a job as we do and uh, actually keep Coleman feeling that safe is pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, Finley Junior High staff, that was also pretty high. Their students, uh, 357 surveys came in. Uh, you can see neutral and I feel safe uh, make up about 75%, 25% said I don't feel safe. We'll look at the reasons why here in a second. Uh, but their parents, for the most part, said they were good. Students, their comments were like, I feel safe with the police around. We have good principal. We have good security. I feel very protected. Those are things that the uh, students say. But then you have things like, I feel like I'm being watched. Maybe it's just my paranoia is what they put in parentheses on there. Or they brought up a lot about like bullying at Finley Junior High or in fights at Finley Junior High. Uh, I will say this at the junior highs, they're kind of getting moved from that elementary school stage to the junior high stage and they start having that freedom and a lot of the safety concerns didn't come back to anybody outside of the school. Um, it had more to do with the fight that went on inside the school. Uh, it, it, it was kind of bullying and the fight that was going on. And then you had parents that would fill it out on the question about whether or not your school is safe. They would say there's girls running around with their midriff showing. So I don't know how that's too correlated. But uh, Howard Junior High staff, out of the 16 surveys, only six disagreed. There, uh, that says Finley sorry, again. Sorry, I messed that slide up. Howard parents, though overwhelmingly are pretty positive. Uh, bullying and fighting were things that the parents talked about. Their students didn't believe uh, any comments. DAP, uh, their campus is safe and secure. <laughs> I mean, that's the school where you walk through a metal detector every day and you have a uniform. So 100% they feel safe and secure. Uh, the students, um, there were 38% of them said they didn't feel safe. Um, but it was things like the bathrooms that they would talk about, or they don't think it's safe for them to walk or ride their bikes because of the traffic around there. It doesn't really have a whole lot to do with how we're doing our business. Global, 9% disagreed. You can see here, 40% of their students said they don't feel safe. Um, but when you ask them why, things would come up with like problems with the emotional stuff that goes on at home. You would add, they would talk about dress code things and things like that. And then equality for students. We didn't get any uh, written responses from the students at Global. And then finally, the Waxahachie High School staff. 12% uh, strongly disagreed and 17% said that they disagreed with that. So this was probably uh, the worst feedback we got with WHS. Okay? Uh, some of the things that they talked about uh, was the fact that, hey, kids can skip school whenever they want to. We've got all these doors on the first level of campus that people can make their way into. Uh, some of the things we talked about was, hey, maybe we, the security team uh, needs some changes. They don't patrol all the parts of the school and all the nooks and crannies. So Bellis and I have had some discussions. We're making some changes in personnel over there. And we're working on ways to address those issues as far as uh, patrolling those areas. Um, yeah, but one of the main things uh, we did during the fight was only five of us out there, so it's hard to cover that much footage. That's where I think there's five officers sitting up there. So it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to control access when uh, students are leaving and skipping like that. We don't know until the very last minute. Most of those exit doors are near the classroom. Estimate they wait for us to come and then they find us 
Well, and that's one of the things we'll talk about too in the next segment, especially when teachers are calling our security officers to handle like uh, discipline issues. We're going to talk about, we need to rethink about what our job are as security and SROs. Uh, out of the students, though, only 18% said they don't feel safe. Most of them, most of them said they do uh, feel safe because they have police and security. This person uh, said that there's security officers everywhere. Nothing bad can happen at this school. Uh, and they talk about how they walk around and they patrol everywhere. Uh, this is one of the things I thought was an interesting quote from Waxahachie, uh, one of the Waxahachie students. And they talk about how, hey, when you go to school and you watch the news and you see the bad things happen to other schools, and it's a reality check that, hey, if you're here, and the students kind of walk around with that feeling. Um, so that's interesting to think about as well. Parents, only 7% said that they didn't feel like their kids were safe. Uh, one of the things they talk about is kids sitting in the parking lot or children in the restroom, uh, drugs all over the school is something they talk about. Uh, part of that, I think, is where did these parents get their information yeah. from? Is the kids. And I think the kids might take a situation where they blow it out of proportion or fill in the blanks with their imagination. So uh, going forward at the elementary level, um, one of the things we talked about was traffic. So we're going to look at that. Uh, we're going to continually assess where we place security officers what's the best place for them. And one of the things I'm really going to push this next year is the kids feel safe because of the relationship they have with their security officers. If you're at an elementary school, if you're at a secondary campus, uh, the kids are going to feel safer if you interact with them. Um, and that's one of the things we're going to be pushing. Uh, and then at the secondary level, like uh, um, the high school, we're going to put a lot of effort into that parking lot guard shack. Uh, we're going to work on security, what our expectations are as far as their socialization is concerned. Uh, and then we're going to look at, is it better to have a security officer stationed at one spot that we know is a hot spot, or is it better to have them moving around to where it looks like there's more officers all over the place? I know that's been a struggle with us this last year. If we thought there were fights in the courtyard, we would send our guys to the courtyard and stay there keep an eye on that, well, everybody knows those security officers are there now and not in other parts of the school. So what's the best place? What's have, the best way to be? You have a priority is bathrooms. We, we saw the, the comment over and over again that that's the area. If there's, if there's one area where students feel safe, un, unsafe, um, is, is restrooms. What, what was your plan there? Uh, first of all, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is uh, Anytime you go to a bathroom like a gas station that says, hey, there's a list of all when we check it. I want our guys to regularly be checking in at all the bathrooms at WHS and be looking in there. Uh, the flip side of that is we can check them, you know, two or three times an hour. The deal is there's 3,000 students at that school of five security officers, so uh, they're going to be constantly on the move. A lot of it goes to getting help, just like Bill was said, help from the teachers. If the teachers see five or six kids going into the bathroom at all, all at one time. Like, okay, if this is while class is going on, go in there and intercede with it and then let us know and we'll come back you up. We'll be on there as quick as we can. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things we're talking about is really how do you focus on the bathrooms and do that better? Any questions? I know that's a lot of information. If you want more of that, uh, the details of that uh, survey, just let me know, and I'll send you all the comments. Josh, thank you very much. Um, we always, like I said, take, take these surveys seriously. We always want to look at, at continued improvement, um, and that will help steer our, our discussions and thoughts as we get into next year. If there are no other thoughts about that, uh, about our, our surveys pre Uvalde, now we want to talk um, about lessons learned from Uvalde um, and discuss um, the, the governor's response. I mean, I can go ahead and address the, the governor's response, and I know um, Josh has some thoughts planned um, regarding um, the specific um, lessons learned in Uvalde. But the governor, um, and you have two letters um, that 
are before you that, that were provided before our meeting, um, and then also copies. Um, the, the main one, um, the June 1st letter um, to the Texas School Safety Center, um, Dr. Uh, Martinez Prather, um, outlines what schools must do before we reopen next school year. Um, fortunately, this team, um, our Safety and Security Committee, uh, we do meet regularly. We do uh, address our uh, multi-hazard operations plan. We did most recently uh, at our last meeting uh, make changes um, to update and add um, requirements and protocols related to train derailment because we have train tracks near our schools. But we, we look at this regularly. And I know that this body helps us keep compliance with, with that aspect. The school behavioral threat assessment team, we'll discuss that in a little bit um, with an upcoming agenda item, but we, we have a safe and supportive schools team. For our schools, a, a different thing that we'll have to do and make sure that we're able to certify to the school safety center by September 9th. Each one of our campuses will have to schedule all of their drills before school starts. We do drills at each one of our campuses because of the duress app that enables our, uh, all of our campus teachers to communicate immediately, like 911 type information to the police department. That system also helps us keep track of our drills. So we're able to see that the drills are done, but we will have to schedule our drills before school starts. Dr. Dr. Hollingsworth? Debriefing. Debriefing, but also make sure that we are uh, uh, documenting, you know, when it is that's happening on each campus. But there needs to be a uh, uh, some people on a duress app. I've had it happen on mine before. You can have the alerts turned off, but you don't hear them. And so it's uh, just a rechecking and making sure it's kind of a. It can be a. It can be a two to three minute just touch and base. Hey, we're going to do. <coughs> Make sure that you're getting Works. it. Works. And then, it, yeah, make sure it's working. And before you leave the library for the faculty meeting, uh, come see Josh or come see Mrs. Harris before we leave today to make sure that it's all squared away. Excellent. That, that kind of thing. And in that regard, I know Ms. James um, added a, a training piece that you did for all of our staff as to how to do um, the duress app and how to get it on your phone. And that was mandatory for all staff. But we can update that um, for all staff. Uh, I spoke after, because I was very reassured after you called me. I thought we had to correct that. Everything's good. So I spoke to several friends that were teachers. And I got a, 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 all levels, everything. And there was not a lot of understanding. Uh, mainly I got that the direct app, the, the, all that thing on my phone. Uh, that's in my drawer. Most of the time. 
time at WHS we tell the teachers, because cell phone reception inside that school is horrible anyway, have it on your desktop. It runs in the background, and if it goes off, it's going to set that alarm off. Um, yeah. And so. there's also an issue that we address early in the year is the Wi-Fi at the high school. And I've heard that that does not improve very much. do it, uh, but we, we need an updated training before school starts, and that doesn't replace the fact that we need to keep it top of mind during meetings during the school year, but I think it will help because when we make it within our training system, it's then mandatory for all employees, so we know that all of our employees can um, get the information and have it set up for their desktops in addition to their phones um, so that it's, it's handy to use. And one of the things I think we had talked with before is a lot of those teachers at the high school didn't feel familiar with the app or how to use it. That's when we went back and said, not only did we say you had to watch this training video before school started, we went and as soon as they came back from Christmas break, we mandated it again, uh, watching that training video. video. Uh, before school starts, I'm going to be getting with the principals and say, hey, this is mandatory. I'm coming to your school for an hour, and I want every teacher to be in the audience, and I'm going to do an in-person training about the app. And I did talk to one of our money subs, and she had no clue about any of it. So we okay. need to be sure ourselves for both training and all. I was going to say, we had a uh, totally in that situation at Howard happened when there was a concern that the student was on. Um, there was a The, the other piece um, that the governor is going to ask us to certify is that at each campus um, we have um, conducted an assessment of the access control procedures, um, such as single access points, locked instruction room doors, visitor check-in procedures, and exterior, exterior door locks. We will be doing that. We do that regularly, but we will be intentionally doing that this summer. Um, our, our principals will be intentionally doing that when we get uh, back to school in the fall. And, and we will um, be, be certifying that information. But in regard to the um, exterior door locks, and I know that this is a passion of, of, of Dr. Hollingsworth um, and, and shared by, by all of us, we're going to be extremely intentional. We've, we've said it before. We mean it. We're going to do it. Our doors, our exterior doors, they will be locked. They will be checked. We will have a single point of entry, um, and that, that's really it. There, there's, there's not a need to, to prop open doors and leave them unattended. There will be times at the high school where there are multiple students going out to a field, whether that's athletics, whether that's band, but there will be someone with the students as that ingress and egress occurs. 
And as soon as all the students are out, the door's going to be shut and locked again. And we're not going to go back into the school until there's an adult who can open the door to let the students back in. So once the students are out in the field, they're out in the field. And at that point, the door is, again, relocked. We're not going to leave a, a soft entry point with a, a, a weight or a wedge or something along those lines to prop the door open. It's not acceptable. Uh, there's the thought of convenience cannot outweigh the, the safety and security of, of the campus. And so that's just something that will not be tolerated from campus principal on down in safety and security. Um, folks will be um, directed to remove weights and wedges and every other kind of measure that uh, might be used. And as um, superintendent has made clear, he is willing to, dis to declare those as surplus waste and dispose of them immediately. I've done it about three times. It is a, it's an ongoing thing. I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what happens. Uh, you're a band director. You're out marching on the field. Um, and one kid out of 180 is going to forget their read or they're going to forget fill in the blank. And it's a pain because and it's a, that's just a reality. Somebody forgot something, and it just it takes away from his ability to coach girls because little Melissa didn't bring this particular thing that she needs out on the field, and it's, it, it means that one of the assistant coaches has to walk back with uh, them. There's just not a good option, uh, and uh, you know, we know that's a reality because you, I'm sure you've lived that, uh, and, and that's just a – but we know for years what the solution has been is – Jacob. There's some education involved. Absolutely. We've always talked about that. The teachers need to be told, you can't do this. Uh, Absolutely. It's happening, and it's never been told that I can remember in a long time. So is, is Ms. James going to assure you that's discipline worthy? When, when you have directed your staff, we will make sure the directions are clear, but that's discipline worthy for staff. It's also discipline worthy for students. Jacob Perry is a normal member of, of this committee. He couldn't be here today. Um, but over our um, campus and student services and specifically student discipline, but working with our principals to ensure that absolutely that's, that's worthy of student discipline, it's worthy of staff discipline if we're doing something to make the school unsafe. We get to make directives for staff and students to, to take measures intentionally to keep the campus safe when those measures are, are when something's done to violate um, something that we've put in to make the campus safe, then yes. That's your right. That's something we got to reemphasize. There has to be a consequence at some point. People understand how important it is. Yes, sir. And I don't think a lot of people are understanding it. They're like, oh, that ain't going to happen. Yes, sir. Well, that's what the lady in Uvalde probably thought too. You know, I, I just, I can see it happening. Josh, any thoughts you wanted to add specifically related to the Uvalde shooting? Uh, no, I think a lot of them are going to come up. I think we're going to cover like three, five, six, and seven uh, discussion items uh, in the upcoming things. But um, I will say this, that when things came at, out about Uvalde and we started getting more accurate information, after it's over, they say, okay, these are the things your school district can do 
in order to be safe. And one of the things they talk about is your school district needs an anonymous tip line. Well, check that off. Wontachi ISD does that. And they say, well, your school district needs a remote alert app. Well, check that off. Wontachi ISD does that. Everything I read after the Uvalde uh, shooting happened from experts, they would talk about these are things your school district needs to be doing. We were doing those things. Now, absolutely, there's some things we can fine tune, uh, especially like propping open doors or um, allowing students into the school without an ID. And we're going to be talking about some of those things here in a second. Uh, so, yeah, there's areas that we can improve, but a lot of it's going to be fine tuning things. And so that, that makes me feel assured. Ms. Edison? In regards to fine tuning and what we can do to help the problem. Reminding the administrator to share with their people. I know Spence shares a building with Coleman, and we work closely together, but with uh, theater camp, uh, band instrument tryouts, and teachers moving since schools got out, we've had multiple people in the building coming in through prop doors uh, that Coleman secretaries have immediately addressed. But we have multiple people in our building while we're still working. Non-friendly individual. Um, so I think reminding those camp people, the sports camp people, the teachers moving classrooms over the summer, um, that they're not just moving into an empty building. You know, there's still right. staff working. And so I think that can help too for the beginning of the year. Well, and one of the things Lee and I were talking about before this is, uh, you know what, if YMCA comes and uses your campus and they don't have key card access to all the doors. I get it. It's going to be inconvenient, but you can't leave our doors propped open. And it's the same thing for teachers. I get it that you're trying to move 16 boxes from your car into your classroom. You can't prop open our doors. There's other people that are working, even though it's summertime. Safety is our top priority. And by all means, I do not mind inconveniencing you if it has to do with the safety of our staff and our students. Right. And our secretaries and people in the building are Thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm going to hold, we'll hold questions right now because I've got one additional item before we get to Josh's presentation, which I think will address a lot of questions. Um, but the item from the governor's office correlates with our, our item four on our agenda, and that is the safe and supportive schools team, um, our behavior threat assessments. Um, we, Walks at ISD, have a district-wide safe and supportive schools team that's all re received training from the school safety center, a uh, full, full day's worth of training. That team consists of Jacob Perry and Ginger Robinson at the top of, of the committee, um, leading the committee, um, but working with David Averett, Lisa Mott, myself, Josh Oliver, um, Brandy Pushovsky over special education, and Melissa Bousquet to manage our behavior threat assessments, conduct the behavior threat assessments, report to superintendent the, the issues when they arise that need to be reported to superintendent, but help each of our campuses have behavior threat assessments. And each of our campuses are led by a team of the campus principal, assistant principal, counselor, and then whoever else needs to be added, just a special education teacher, a coach, a fine arts teacher, security officer, a, a, as needed. Each year, we submit a, survey results regarding the behavior threat assessments that were conducted during the school year and, and the results from the behavior threat assessments. Jacob Perry takes care of our reporting and he has done that already for this year. Normally that's in November. There was another one 
just a few weeks ago. It's due um, at the end of June. We've already submitted our data. Uh, but I, I know Ginger Robinson is uh, very aware of, of this process and just wanted to give you the opportunity to, to speak to um, th this process um, at, at our campuses and our, our compliance with, with what's expected. Thank you, Ginger. Any questions related to the behavior threat assessments? All right. Thank you all. Um, from here, um, moving on to our discussion regarding our safety drills at campuses, pertaining to all hazards and threats, um, and, and some of the other items we have on our agenda. I know um, Josh has a presentation prepared. Check-in procedures, everything. We'll, we'll cover it all right, right up to the end. Okay, so uh, after we did our last we took those things and we put uh, their recommendations into district improvement plan items. And so some of these are carryovers from that and it's things that we're still working on. We've accomplished some of those things. But I just kind of wanted to go over these are the main things. These are the things that we want to do next year. And I wanted to kind of get your feedback on it. Uh, first of all, we're going to train all the staff in the standard response protocol. Uh, before I left it open to the principals and said, hey, if you want me to come do a 45-minute presentation, let me know. Most of them took me up on that. Not all of them did. This year, it's not going to be something that, that I allow to make a decision. It's going to be mandatory. I'm going to spend an hour with every one of your staff members uh, at some point uh, before we come back from the school. That way we can go over that standard response protocol. Uh, this is per Governor Abbott, all drills. Before school even starts, we're going to need you to submit when you're going to do those drills. Now, I get it. There's sometimes we have to pull an audible, and let's say I schedule the fire drill, and then all of a sudden it's 16 degrees outside and I put a snow on the ground. I mean, we wouldn't be here, but weather happens, okay? We don't want to do fire drills in the middle of a thunderstorm. Uh, there's been times when we had a lockdown drill that was scheduled, and that day, uh, there was some sort of threat or something that came in online overnight. So we probably don't want to do that threat the next day. But one of the big deals is we want all those drills scheduled before school starts. We're going to assess our asset control, our, our access control. We've already been doing that. We're talking about alarming all the first four doors at all the campuses. That way, if you don't swap your card when you go out to recess, it's going to set a loud alarm off at the door. If you're a student, and you push that door open and you didn't slide out and you're trying to let one of your friends in and you bop, uh, you hit the bar to let that door open, that alarm's going to go off. We're going to be notified of it. Um, so not only that, we're assessing access control. Uh, our hopes are, you'll see one of the agenda items is that we get one of the, uh, it's a Cox grant that we're applying for. Um, one of our hopes is right now, if you come to any one of our elementary schools, come through the first set of exterior doors and you're in a glass vestibule and you have to talk to the office staff and check in and they do a visual scan of them. So our plan going forward, if we can utilize this grant, is you won't even be able to come into that vestibule. We will want you to check in at a kiosk outside of those doors uh, and the office will be able to look at you through a video camera, assess whether or not you need to be there or if you're a threat, check your ID at the door and then allow you into the atrium and then the office area and then the rest of the school. So adding one more layer of security to that, yes. Josh, I've heard, I believe it's Palmer, I'm not sure. They have their wrapper machine outside. Integrated into the kiosk. Yeah, yes. they put it in that would be some people had to make. You know. But that, that's definitely one of the things that, mm -hmm. it, it, everything's kind of, it, it depends on whether or not we get this grant. Uh, but I think that's a great idea. If, no, I'm not even letting you into our, our little glass vestibule before you slide your card and we find out whether or not you're supposed to be there. Just be another way that all checks all their campuses too. What's that? Sometimes the newer stuff doesn't work. All their campuses as well, so we just to make sure that we 
generation for the cops grant, they were asking like the average age of our school buildings, and yours kind of bumped ours up quite a bit. <laughs> uh, we're going to implement visitor check-in for special events. I talk pretty regularly with Tim Hicks. He's the guy over at the Logan. And the two biggest discussions we always have is, do you have roll-up doors on your practice facilities, your athletic facilities? And I go, yes, and they drive me nuts. Because it leaves us completely vulnerable. So not only are we not going to prop open doors, we need to have a big discussion about we don't leave roll-up doors open either. So but that's a that's a thing for the athletic department. The other thing is, how do y'all handle grandparents' day? We love the fact that grandparents get to come to our campuses, but whenever we have those special events, we throw a raptor out the window, and we don't care who shows up. Uh, that leaves our kids and our campuses very vulnerable when it comes to special events like that. So we need to rethink how we do uh, visitor check-in. There's ways already with Raptor where people can get pre-approved for it. If you've ever scanned in for Raptor, it keeps your information in the system, and I can just sign up and say, hey, I'm planning on coming to Grandparents Day. They can pre-screen me through the system and have my name badge ready to go at the table waiting. So there are options. A lot of the technology we already have in place, we just need to implement the procedures. Josh, real quick. Uh-huh. We, we we'll guess at least when we have those events and those parents and visitors come to our campus, are we a guess at least doing the metal detectors at those schools for that particular day? That's a good question. We have, uh, we have enough metal detectors Absolutely. in the school district where we could provide each elementary school with a metal detector. The question for the district and the district leaders is, if it's grandparents' day, do we want to walk all the grandparents to a metal detector for grandparents' day? And that's a discussion we need to have if that's something we want to implement. We have to launch it, right? We have to have a staff for the senior. We would have to have a security. I think a security officer could probably do it by themselves. The only deal is if the security officer is monitoring, monitoring the metal detector, then the security officer is monitoring the rest of the thing. Well. So. Yeah, but that's one of those chair activities going on at that point in time anyway. Yeah. Is it the front door? Mm hmm. And that's where your threat's going to be if it comes in. Right. So. Uh, that's definitely an option that we have. Miss Mott, do you have any thoughts on metal detecting Grandma before she comes to the. Mm -hmm. I will say this, that at graduation, when we were checking all the bags that came into graduation, there was only one person that we thought might have a firearm. She stopped when they started checking her bag. It was an older female. And when they started looking at her bag, she grabbed it and said, I'm going to go put this back in my car and proceeded to do so. And our people followed her out there. Um, so you're right. Grandma might be the one that... But, but, but there's a, there is there's a lot of safety um, and security in, involved with that raptor check where you have someone check in they're registered on our campus we then know whether um, they are a prohibited offender and shouldn't be at school in the first place but we have a, a record of them uh, that has been our general safety measure the issue with the things like grand friends day has been that we haven't even been doing that because we want to process people going through, and so we've, we've elevated convenience over safety and security. The, the change is that we're going to make everyone, even on Grand Friends Day, be checked in. Um, we can have a, a more streamlined process before the day occurs where they give us their, their name and their driver's license number and their date of birth so that we can pre-check them in and have a sticker waiting on them. Um, but it, if they don't do that process, they're going to still have to stay in the line to make sure they then get that process and then sticker that has their picture from their driver's license to, to let us know who they are. Uh, another thing is all doors will remain closed and locked during the classroom instruction. This was the standard. This was the norm. COVID hit, then all of a sudden they were like, we don't want all the kids trapped in one room with like the air. So they were like, teachers, feel free to leave your doors open. Uh, it was hard policing this before COVID came along. Then COVID came and messed things up. And I don't know what it is, but there are teachers that hate 
shutting their classroom door while class is going on. Um, I have had teachers that when one of our SROs talked to them about leaving their door open there in classroom instruction, they had doctor's notes saying, uh, no, because of my anxiety, the doctor said I should leave the door open. That's kind of the stuff we're battling with with some of these teachers. I will say this, though. Um, one of the things that concerns me about Uvalde is not only the prop door that was open, how did you get into the classroom uh, once you got into the school? We treat, we teach with our uh, standards response protocol. While you're teaching, leave that door shut, leave that door locked, because that's one step you don't have to take if we go into a lockdown. And we talk about it's a time barrier between you and the bad guy. We have to keep all doors closed and locked during classroom instruction. Now, I will say this, too. Um, right before I came over here, I'm teaching a class over at the police department. There's somebody from the Duncanville Police Department that was in there, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to the safety video. You leave a love down about what went on in Duncanville. I go, what happened? Was the guy just crazy? And he goes, yeah. He walked in with a cigarette in one hand and a pistol in the other one, went to go light up a cigarette, and the coach... Uh, walked up to him and was going to intervene with it. And he didn't even notice the guy at first. He said, you can't smoke in here. That's what the guy pulled out the gun. And the coach was like, oh, you've got a gun? The guy started firing at him. He went to a classroom, and guess what? The classroom door was shut and locked. Okay? He tried shooting at that. Couldn't do it. Because when you solid core wood doors, uh, went over to where the glass door was, the glass door to the gym was locked, and he started shooting through the glass. The, the, the area where they were had already done a lockdown, called the police department. All the kids in the gym knew to get away from the front doors. Uh, he had just entered the gym when Duncanville Police Department they had a two-minute response time, walked in and stopped the threats. I honestly believe because those doors were shut and locked, nobody was killed at that time. Um, it's important that the doors are shut and locked. It makes a difference. And we tell people, it's a time barrier. All we, we're trying to put everything in place to give you as much time to survive until the cops can show up and put a stop to this threat. And if locking the door gives me an extra 45 seconds, two minutes, whatever it is, that can save lives and that can save kids' lives. So locking classroom doors is important. Um, we're working with emergency management. I know that they have NIMS courses and ICS training available. We're going to work on that stuff and try to get at least our principals and APs and stuff more of this training over the summer. Uh, this is one of the things that's in there. Do we want to use metal detectors at the Amer uh, elementary school level, uh, especially visitors? I think that's a discussion we need to have, and I'm a proponent for it. Uh, once you do have a visitor on campus, uh, do we just turn them loose? Uh, or do we make sure that they're in the presence of a staff member at all times? This is one of the things that uh, our uh, the last audit we did covered. They said if your visitors are on campus, you probably need to have a staff member escort them around. We're going to practice drills. We're pretty good about practicing our direct drills. But we do, do we do a lockdown drill during the middle of lunchtime? That's something we probably need to think about. Uh, do we do a uh, secure while all the kids are on the playground during recess? What are they going to do if we do it? We probably need to have those practices. So we want to practice those duress drills, not only during the easy part of the day when this is going to be not so complicated. Let's have a fire drill during lunch break to see how we respond to it. I want to practice it. Listen, if we practice a lockdown drill while kids are at lunch, it may be the worst drill we've ever had. But at least we can learn from it. That way, if we have to do it for real, we'll be better next time. So, yeah, we need to practice those drills. Okay, those need to take place at transportation and support services in here as well. Absolutely. I'll pull the fire alarm anytime you tell me to, Alyssa. Uh, once those feedback, once those drills are over, let's provide feedback. Let's see how it went. I like going to the campuses when we do those drills, and after it's over, all the principals are going to be like, my work didn't go off. And I go, well, it did. Just you were looking at your phone, so it didn't make 
make a sound like you already had it pulled up. So try to troubleshoot those things. But let's do feedback and let's analyze how it goes. We talked about the entry on all the campus. I love the idea of putting a kiosk, especially if we can scan people with Raptor from the outside before they make it, uh, make it in there. All staff, all secondary students, we have to wear our things. We were talking about consequences earlier. I want consequences for our secondary students that don't wear their IDs on campus because it's outrageous. Um, I'll go over there, and this is not an exaggeration. I personally, alone by myself, will stop around 100 kids uh, as they come in through the bus entrance and tell them to go to the office to get visitor IDs because they're not wearing their IDs. There's got to be some sort of consequence for this. Why? We've had kids that don't go to school at Watsahatchee ISD make their way into the school. IDs are important. It's how we know who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there. And this is something that we're going to get, me and my team are going to be passionate about this next year. Um, monitor students along the others into entrances. This is something we got feedback with from those surveys. I think if we put alarms on the doors, that's going to help go a long way with that. Um, but that's something we're going to be paying attention to. This is the last one, and this might step on some toes of some principles. Um, one of the things I was thinking about with Uvalde and the Duncan Bill that, thing, that happened is a lot of times I get feedback, hey, all my security guard does is like sit in the office and watch the front doors. Look, that's their job, uh, is my response. Uh, if, if my guys are watching and making sure that all the perimeter doors are locked, uh, if they walk around to make sure nobody is hanging out on the outside of the campus or the parking lot that's not supposed to be there, and they watch those front doors, then I'm okay with that. Our security officers are a lot like firefighters, okay? Uh, they might not do a whole lot of work during the day, but we pay them and they're in that position for what they might have to do, not for what they do do. Does that make sense? Um, so a lot of the times, our elementary school principals pull, pull these, uh, the security officers or our school marshals away from their office or from the front, or watching their doors or making their rounds because they have to go get them to go, uh, they have a, a sped kid that has not out first, okay? First of all, I have issues with you calling the armed guys to restrain a special ed kid. Okay, I have big issues with that. I have, I have even bigger issues with you calling the uniformed police officers with guns to come restrain the special ed kids. That is something we have got to get away from. Josh, even retrieving kids in the classroom because they're, I don't know, for whatever reason, they're asking to go and get kids out of the classroom. Absolutely. bathrooms at WHS, that's an exaggeration, but uh, they don't have time to go pull kids out of the class for administrators. Uh, so we need to reevaluate the role of the security officers. Uvalde, if they taught us anything, is that our security officers aren't there to go help out with the spend. If they're not there to help out with the discipline issues, our security officers are there to keep the threats from coming into the school. And if there is a threat inside the school, put a stop to that. Josh? Yes? Real quick question. Uh, you mentioned in Bali. Who would be the chain of command? If something like you Bali happened? Uh -huh. uh, it was interesting listening to them. Uh, so the way NIMS works is uh, when you have a person that responds to the scene. So let's say you have an SRO officer that's at that school. He's going to be in charge until somebody else comes and relieves him. Like the police. Uh, right. Uh, now, I don't want a Monday morning quarterback Uvalde. My, my look at Uvalde is, first of all, if there's any kind of gunshot that happened in our school, I'm worried about kids that may have been in shut been shot and maybe bleeding out, we're not going to stop until, one, we stop the killing, and then our next goal is to go in there and stop the dying. Um, from what I understand, 
uh, the police department was prohibited from doing that because of a solid steel door with all these locks that they couldn't get into. Uh, Chief Goldsby mentioned earlier that we're already working on the way it works with most doors is I can get a battering ram and I can smash that door in. Well, all of our school doors, yeah, they open to the outside. You can't bash them in. So Chief Goldsby's already started working on getting us gear um, that if we have to go into that door, I mean, sledgehammers and prop bars and everything that can get us in there. Well, not only that, one of the biggest problems with Uvalde was they searched around trying to find keys to the classrooms. Every one of our SROs has keys in our classrooms. Our patrol, uh, our SWAT commander has keys to the classrooms. That's why I look at Uvalde and I think, okay, check. We've done this, we've done this good. As an extra layer of protection, just in case we do need keys to get to one of those classrooms, and for some unknown reason, I can't find a principal or a staff member that has those keys, we're uh, taking a play from the fire department's playbook and we're hiding a set of master keys somewhere in the school. Uh, it'll be the same spot in all the schools and the police officers will know where it is, but it'll give them access to those classrooms so we're not standing outside for an extended period of time we can't get in. Do they have master keys? Just Yeah. How it went off into is like, oh my gosh, we can it. But they couldn't get in. And we talked about that. Is there like a, uh, they have master keys to the outside too? So they have, like, every officer, uh, every patrol officer at the police department has the same key card that gets everybody into the school. Okay. They have a key card. So they Yeah. Okay. When we talk about the master key, that's the problem is that if I'm trying to get into a classroom and somebody barricaded themselves in, like what happened at Uvalde, they can't get in. Well, all my SROs could, because they have master keys and everything. Every security officer has master keys and everything. What we're saying is that for some reason, those people aren't there, which I can't imagine why they wouldn't be, but if one of those people aren't there, we're going to have a set of those master keys in case they need them. I see something I was thinking about. We all have master keys. Check that. I, I want you to go. All the people about that. Yeah. Go over there, but it still has changed. That's been I'm here for 15 years now. That's what I was going to tell you. That, um, yeah. This week, uh, or before the end of the month, let we'll you and Geronimo go over there together and see what the issue. And we'll either change out those locks or get another key. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like, absolutely. Well, and that, works. that's the deal with the propped open door. Um, that teacher said, I saw him coming. He had a gun, so I was calling 911, and I shut the door, and it just didn't lock behind me. Um, in the heat of the moment, she may have shut the door, but probably didn't check to make sure that it locked behind her if something got wedged in the door. That's why you never know when that panic moment's going to come, when the heat of the moment's going to come. So that's why we can't prop open doors. Because you're probably not going to be able to react fast enough when there's a guy moving at you with a gun. And I think that's why it's so good that you already check every single door on every single campus because there are doors that um, just go in and out for reasons, whatever. I mean, it's not a panic situation, but you close them, they don't, they stick. And right. So that's why I think that audit would be really good. It, it, it includes this building, too. Um, the, the door, and we have to have it, it's our um, disability uh, ADA door, is our rear door but it hangs and we've addressed that with support services and in the process of, of fixing that door. So, you know, much like Ms. Robert Huber said, you know, when we talk drills, 
we're talking drills with support services and um, this building as well. Now we need to prep some of those folks that, that haven't been doing drills on our um, campuses where we don't have students um, so that we can at least have some preparation before we start drills. We don't want people to be set up to fail, but we want to talk it and then go do it. Yes, ma'am. What's that? The shield. How expensive are they? Could we have one at each campus? Do you think that could work? Uh, that that's one of those things on my wish list. Mm -hmm. um, the police department recently purchased uh, a couple of shields for their patrol shifts. They are rifle proof. I mean, you can shoot them with an AR-15 and it'll stop that bullet. Um, so I would love to get a couple of those. Do you remember off the top of your head, ballpark, how much they cost? I don't remember because we buy so many of them. Oh, yeah. Um, they're not that expensive. Uh, a couple of thousand dollars, maybe three thousand. I'm going to take a thousand. Yeah. Well, maybe one three thousand dollars for the town. We'll give one to each principal. One to each principal. So look, looking at our agenda, did you have anything you wanted to add on that um, COPS um, School Violence Prevention Program grant? No, Lisa, Lisa and I have been, we're, we're not grant writers and we're thrown in the deep end on this, so we'll, we'll figure it out. But I'm staying optimistic. I'm sure after the Uvalde thing happened, a lot of schools did what we did, kind of reassessed things and said, well... Maybe we can apply for this grant and see if we can get I want to give a thank you to Mr. Calden. He helped get the initial part of our grant submitted yesterday, um, but by June 21st we'll have it finalized. And, and some of the items that we're specifically looking at, um, making sure that we've got um, emergency sound um, on all of our doors, um, the exterior doors, so if they're left open, if they're open without a employee badging and they're left open, there's a, there's a sound um, that will audibly tell people this needs to be shut. In addition, we're, we're seeking those kiosks, at the entry point, so that each one of our campuses, before we even get into the vestibule, so outside, there'd be a, a video kiosk that someone would be able to, to state the reason that they're coming to campus and wrapped her in. Again, we don't know how successful we'll be um, in grant, getting grant funds when the rest of the world is probably seeking the same funds, but we'll, we will pursue it on behalf of the district and then also look for future plans and to, to see what we can do with district funds. Gets us into the next topic, and we don't have much left uh, on this agenda, but to Coach Venable's point, we are coming into our year for our triannual security audit. This committee generally, in, in years past, conducted the audit. Three years ago, when, right before Lieutenant Oliver came into the district, we contracted with Region 10 to do this audit for us. We had an audit performed, and then as Lieutenant Oliver joined the district, he received a new fresh audit that was presented to the school board and was able to, to build an action plan to, to address concerns from that audit. But it is a function of this committee to make sure the audit gets done and then gets submitted to the school board so the school board can review the audit. This coming school year, and it's the entire school year that, that each, each, each school district is allowed to conduct an audit, our committee will again resume the reins of, of taking care of the audit, conducting the audit. And so uh, Lieutenant Oliver will have all of the, the training components um, taken care of before the school year starts. And so our first meeting when we get back together in September will be a discussion regarding our audit. And we will... Um, each sign up for a few campuses um, to, to go thoroughly conduct an audit. And that audit will involve at least four hours on a campus, whether that's the drop-off of students to lunch or if that's lunch to um, the pickup of students, to, to look at the procedures that, that are undergone at each of our campuses and also interviews with principal, assistant principal, counselor, nurse, special education teacher, an aide, to go through questions that the school safety center has an outline. Each of you that uh, may be in positions where you need a substitute will get a substitute. I mean, this is, this is work related, but we'll schedule with you to, to ensure that you're able to help us participate 
and conduct a thorough audit. And we're gonna be looking at every door at, at every campus. Now again, we're going through what we must do this summer, but in addition, it's an ongoing process. You, you don't just do it once and say, okay, well in 22, we're now done. You, you gotta keep looking at it. That's the reason we're required to do an audit every three years. That's the reason we're given a full school year to do an audit. It's to do a good job. It's to look for problems. Um, I did one with um, Coach Venable, I remember, um, at Wildman, and uh, it was global high school at that time. Um, and uh, Coach Venable um, surprised me with his creativity. And I um, encouraged the uh, creativity again um, to, to see what are all the, the ways we can, we can get into the... Um, to the buildings, um, what what are um, potential concerns? I know that um, Chief Goolsby uh, mm -hmm. has has helped us um, in the years since our audit with um, having undercover officers um, come into our schools. We presume um, Chief Goolsby, without knowing his um, thorough plans, but we'll be doing that again um, this coming school year. That's something that the governor has said um, he wants to see statewide. Well. Fortunately, we've already had that. Now, COVID um, stopped um, a little bit of that, but um, Josh is hoping for a perfect score um, the next time um, Chief Goolsby sends um, someone that Josh doesn't know. There you go. There you go. Yeah, but it, it's, all, it's all to make us better. It's all to make us more sound. Um, so that will be something for this committee to tackle, um, the, the safety and security audit. And then um, we will be assembling our new team um, in September. It is not my intention to roll anyone that's here off the team. We will be adding some more to our team. But if there's some of you who um, don't believe you can faithfully serve um, on, our, on our team going forward, let me know. Um, but otherwise, I, I, will, I will be inviting those of you who are here with us back. And again, I'll, I'll, we're going to have some more strategic entries um, into this team. But I thank you very much um, for your, your service this school year. Um, I don't anticipate needing another meeting um, this summer of this team um, prior to September of, of next school year. We will be taking care of the, the components that, that the governor asks us to do, and I believe that we will be in, in full compliance. Um, I genuinely thank you, uh, and just know that if there's anything you want to um, ask or inquire about between now and our next meeting, please do so. Me, Josh Oliver. You name it, please, please ask us or, or make us aware of any concerns. Okay. Is there anything else anyone wants to add? Any other questions you have regarding anything that we've discussed uh, on, on our agenda or anything else that you, you believe should be discussed this time? Ms. Kriegel? Okay. I, I agree with you. I think, is that some of what's happening? Yeah, we're, we're doing some. We did some last night with some other camp. We're not taking over the YMCA to help them with their security issues. So we, we have people that's willing to be involved. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Can we see it? Okay. And the YMCA, that's above and beyond. Um, ultimately, the, the, the Y is conducting its own program. But we know that those kids, not all, but many of them, they live here, they're our kids, and so we care about them. Thank you, Officer Nolan. Any other questions, any other concerns, anything that you'd like to discuss? Can, can I just clarify on the, on the door alarms? Is that only if you get the grants, or is that a done deal? Because I know in the past we used to have doors that if the door was propped open, they would get a signal to the administration building. I remember it was all perfect. And we get a phone call. And, and, and so I didn't know um, that is not on all of our doors um, at, at this time, and, and there's not, 
in a, in a budget year that is lean, and that, that's just the, the truth, there, there's not extra funds that are just sitting there to do that for all doors. So that, that's, at this time, the, the reality is that that's a grant-depended improvement. That doesn't mean that that can't become something that's a priority going into another year. That's why we get to do a safety and security audit and then make a, a, a list of, well, present the audit to the to the board, school board, as, as it's supposed to be. That will be next summer, summer of 23, and then the board can help us prioritize um, additional improvement. Is that, a, is that where the door's problem the alarm that goes off at the door, or is it like an alarm that goes off in security or something? Talking to bat security, it can be all Both. of the above. Right. They'll have an audible alarm at the door, and because of the way that the security system is already set up, once that alarm goes off, it can send text notifications to security officers and principals that are at that school. Ms. Craig. still have the grant router. Um, yes. Uh, Christy Goodman, is our federal grant. Okay. Some, thank you. There's going to be federal grants. There's going to be a lot of grants. No, the one we applied for was federal. It is, it is a federal grant. Uh, the one that we are working on, right. it is right. a federal grant. Right. I don't, I don't think there's going to be other grants. Motion to refer. Any other questions or thoughts? Thank you all very much for your time. I'd said to you all before this meeting, I hope to get us out at 1030. It is 1046. But at, at 1046, do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. <laughs> I got a motion. <laughs> A motion from Phil Gerke. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, we got a second from Chief Goolsby. Um, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much.